Welcome to the Hermetic Astrology Podcast. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm Gary Caton here in the New River Valley of Southwest Virginia. You can find me on the web at dreamastrologer.com. Be sure when you stop by there to sign up for my newsletter or there on the homepage. I keep threatening to put one of those out. At some point, I will make good on that threat. You can also find links to all my social media, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter, X, whatever that thing is these days. Um, you can follow me there and uh, and keep in touch. So I wanted to talk to y'all about Mercury because predictably I started to see you know, people talking about Mercury being in the shadow. And I thought, I, 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 okay, here we go. Here's another um, opportunity for me to um, kind of dilute that idea with some um, other stuff that I've found that I think is much more useful and much more um, productive. So I'm going to share some... Uh, visuals with y'all if you're listening on the audio version i'll do my best to describe what i'm talking about but if you want you can also visit the youtube channel where you can subscribe and like and all that good stuff there as well and you can also see the visuals that i'm about to share so mercury in virgo really the moment mercury entered virgo um, which was uh, on July 28th. So that's been uh, more than 10 days now. Um, this began something that I call the uh, Mercury Elemental Year of Earth, or shall we say the next installment of the Mercury Elemental Year of Earth. And what I mean by that is that Mercury spends more time in the earth signs this year than all of the other signs combined. And uh, I made a little visual on Astro Seek to, to show you that. Like this is literally um, the various signs and you can see like just the pie shapes, like it's way, way bigger because of course Mercury goes through both indirect and retrograde motion in the earth signs. And so it gets three passes rather than one. So it spends much more time. Um, and th this is a really significant um, accent on the earth signs. And so all of the things that earth signs represent, which primarily, you know, earth signs represent earth, right? It's like resources, um, you know, I just filled my belly a little while back uh, with uh, venison and uh, chanterelle mushrooms that I got in the woods here behind the house and some uh, some onions and uh, uh, beets that I grew in the garden. So the fruit, the fruits of the earth. Um, so the idea of like, you know, food and where you get your food and what the quality of the food that you're putting in your body very much an earth sign issue um resources you know whether that be money whether that be um other resources you know how you're you're getting those where you're getting those um of course the idea of inflation has been a really big uh thing for a while many people were convinced we were doomed for to experience a um a, a, a recession you know, so that those those economic concerns being front and center, you know, everybody's um, watching the the CPI, you know, and the the core. I can't even remember what it's called, but you know, they're they're watching the numbers as the as the inflation rates. You know, is it going down? Is it going down enough? What's the Fed going to do about it? You know, um, and so these these conversations, if you will, about resources have been front and center um and they're much more likely to be front and center now as mercury is once again in one of the earth signs 
Um, they're kind of front and center all year in a way, but of course, as Mercury is literally in the Earth signs, they will be more so. And so, um, you know, I'm talking to you today on August the 9th because this is literally the first of a triptych, a tripartite alignment that Mercury makes with the sun in the middle degrees of Virgo. And these are near the stars of, um, they're near the stars that represent um, the back of the lion. And so they represent a, uh, a lunar mansion that's called Al Zubra, which is called, that means the main. So there's a, there's a person riding the lion and they're holding on to the main, right? Um, but also the stars of Ursa Major are here as well. Um, there's other things, but specifically in these degrees, um, which are about 12 to 15 degrees of Virgo. So if you have anything there, um, this particular installment of the Mercury Elemental Year is likely to affect you personally. If, you, if we go back to the previous installment, um, Taurus, you know, I'm Aquarius rising and Taurus is my fourth house, which is about home and family and so forth. And, you know, Mercury stationed, I think, about 15 degrees retrograde and about five degrees direct. Neither of those really hit any planets in my chart. But this one, the 12 degrees of Taurus, that hits my Mars. And so the last time around fourth house, um, I ended up dealing with a huge bunch of issues with uh, my sister and my father got into it and they, and, and, uh, and my father ended up, um, you know, wanting to uh, move and there was nowhere for him to move. And so it, it, long story short is I had to figure out, help figure out how to get my father into a nursing home from 500 miles away. And so, you know, that was a major disruption. Here I am just trying to do, you know, live my life and do my work and everything. And now I've got all this extra stuff on my plate, talking to people at Medicaid and at the nursing home and at the hospital and yada, yada, yada. But, you know, these degrees were much more cued into my chart. And these degrees represent... um what are known as the maximum elongations of Mercury and also the Kazemi of Mercury. And because what I discovered is that these three events are astronomically related so that the, um, the greatest elongation of Mercury as evening star, where Mercury is the furthest from the sun and therefore the most available to be seen in the sky, the invisible conjunction with the sun and then the elongation as morning star, where Mercury is most available to be seen in the morning. These three events, though they're separated by about 40 days, and they're very different in terms of their sky appearance, evening, invisible, morning, they happen in the same degrees. And this and this is true every single time, um, which is pretty amazing. And so it's kind of... Uh, and and I realized that it was sort of reflecting the text in the Emerald Tablet, which doesn't say as above, so below. That is a somewhat crude, though basically fair rendition of what it says. Um, the Latin translation of what it says is that which is below corresponds to that which is above, and that which is above corresponds to that which is below. So above, right, e evening elongation, above the horizon, visible, below the horizon, right, invisible conjunction, and then above the horizon again. Below corresponds to above, above corresponds to below. And so there's this, um, there's this sort of conversation between the above and the below. There's this correspondence. There's this, there's... Um, and of course, they're also talking about like, you know, the, the conscious versus the unconscious. Um, 
the powers of the intellect versus the powers of the instincts and and so forth right the the, the mind versus the body uh, all of these ideas that above and below that there's this um series of connections happening between these very opposite um polarities right later in the emerald tablet it says it rises from earth to heaven and then descends again to earth thereby combining within itself the powers of above and below so this idea that you know as jung said until you make the unconscious conscious it will direct your life and you will call it fate You'll think you're being directed by, you know, some hidden force when really it's just your own unconscious. The, and and the, and and once you become aware of what's going on, these unconscious forces that are moving you, you can then to regain um, your sovereignty. You can regain your um your free will because you you now you're aware oh wow you know i have these strong instinctual urges and they're kind of making me you know get into these situations over and over and over again and i i, I see these repeating patterns in my life and i think it's some kind of fate from outside of me imposing itself on me when really it's just my own instincts it's my own emotional patterns it's my own you know emotional um history trauma whatever you want to call it that is that is creating these situations in my life you see so this idea of above and below interacting is very profound and very alchemical so you know trying to simplify this period where mercury is um you know about to go retrograde then the retrograde proper and then moving on from the retrograde trying to simplify that is in into well, don't do x y or z for six weeks or however long and and, and then you know go back to normal that's really a, a huge missed opportunity you see because we're talking about like reclaiming your freedom reclaiming your your sovereignty as the creator of your own world that's what's possible here so to just simplify it down to like oh don't you know don't send any important communications for a while man that's so missing the point <clears throat> the you know, in in her in hermeticism, humanity. Well, not just in hermeticism. I mean, Achilles even talks about this, right? Uh, and if you haven't read read, you know, the Iliad, you you've probably seen the movie Troy, where he says something similar. Unfortunately, the gods were kind of neutered from that uh, from the dialogue there. But this one one instance, he says, you know the gods are jealous of us because we are alive we they will they will never know the the sweetness of this of this one chance that we have to 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 be alive and to um and to dance with the with the elements and and to um to have successes and to endure tragedies and all of these things you know um and so in in hermetics um this idea that we are we have we share in the divine nature we share in a connection with to god with the gods um we share in a connection with the divine we have that but we also have this um power of manifestation of embodiment that that the gods don't have and so we are um of we are of the nature of the above and the below right so that so so this mixing of the above and the below is really the mixing of our two natures it's coming to know the, both parts of our nature the the divine part of our nature and the um 
material part of our nature. And unfortunately, you know, in this day and age, with science being so blatantly materialistic and just, you know, reducing everything to just random accidents of of electrons bumping into each other, there's no, you know, they have pretty much rejected entirely, actually, though they claim to be, you know, of the mind, they have rejected the true above is our connection with with the divine with it's and yes through our mind through our spirit through our intellect we can um further that but if our intellect is only engaged with with manipulating material reality then we have really rejected our divine birthright of a connection to the gods and to god you see um and so it's understanding that we are dual nature and that these periods are going to really highlight both of those natures and kind of highlight the places where they are at odds, highlight the places where if we're too focused on the below, something is going to come along to say, no, 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 that's it. Enough of that. I'm not going to let you do that anymore because you you got to stop it for a little bit and remember who you are you are you are you know in in um orphism they they have a saying i am a child of the earth and the starlit sky right above and below um so you so to remember that we're children of the earth yes but also of the starlit sky right that we have this divine connection this is the gift of this time, of this mixing. And we can talk about microcosm and macrocosm in the sense of the mixing between the collective and the personal, um, between you know my little world and the world out there. Um, there's a lot of different mixings that are going on, and we can talk about those more as we go along. And this is this is natural because what's happening right now. In fact, maximum elongation is, yes, it is um, It is the place where Mercury and the sun are the furthest apart during this cycle that they will be in terms of zodiacal longitude, right? So that's one way to understand it. Um, but they are also, what's happening is the reason why they were separating is Mercury was moving faster than the sun and they reached this elongation and then what happens is Mercury's speed slows to match that of the sun, and then it slows further. And as it slows, then the sun begins to catch Mercury. So there's like this, and then back, back together, right? So in terms of zodiacal longitude, we can understand it that way. But this idea that Mercury is slowing to match the speed of the sun belies the fact that Mercury is also about to penetrate the inner sanctum of our system that is the what astronomers call the astronomical unit what i call the heart space of our system the, the space between the earth and the sun the center of our system there are only three planets that can do that that can penetrate that space that can be closer to the earth than the sun is and those are mercury venus and mars and um and so to me these planets are the ones where the real juice is. You know, the outer planets are great. And if I get to them, you know, that yeah, we can find some interesting stuff there. But my main focus is on these three planets very much intentionally because they are the ones that form the heart of the system. Mercury, Venus, and Mars are the only ones that can penetrate this inner sanctum. And that's what Mercury is doing at greatest elongation, Mercury's speed matching that of the sun belies the fact that it is also, in terms of what my friend Adam Gainsburg calls Earth proximity, Mercury is in this part of the orbit. Notice how it has this loop on the outside of this ring, and then it loops inside the ring. So Mercury is penetrating the inner sanctum of our system from now deep all the way into the middle of the retrograde at the conjunction with the sun. This is the deepest penetration, the, the closest approach to Earth, and then moving back out again. 
right? So there's this mixing between the outer world and the inner world, between the above and the below, between forward motion, which is sort of like normal consensus reality, and retrograde motion, which is sort of you know, some kind of alternative reality, some some iconoclastic idea of like, you know, and the the main thing that people forget, you know, they they think, oh, okay, planet's going retrograde, therefore there's going to be problems. Well, certainly you enter the retrograde with some amount of problems already in your life. What if you have a problem and the problem gets reversed? A reversed problem is what's typically known as a solution, right? And so, you know, it's really interesting, for instance, like with the um, financial markets. Um, uh, and I know, you know, I had a complaint on the last video when I talked about Bitcoin and stuff, but just broadly regarding all of the financial markets, right? Because Earth is about resources, as we said before. Um, there's a lot of people for a long time who thought, you know, inflation got really bad really quick. And people were like, oh, my God, this is bad. This is not going to end well. I, we're going into a recession, right? And they they gave, you know, very little chance for the so-called soft landing of of managing to bring down inflation without throwing us into a recession. Well, so far, so good. We're actually, the re inflation is coming down and the economy is still doing pretty good. So the reversal might be that we have to realize, guess what? There's not going to be a, a recession. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, and so, and so, you know, it, it, I say this because a couple days ago, there was an interesting, you know, I follow the crypto markets quite a bit. And there was an interesting development a couple days ago with respect to um, what's known as the idea of mass adoption, where crypto will become more mainstream. And for it to become more mainstream, it has to become more easily available to more people. And so the PayPal which is actually the company that I use to process my payments from my members and from people who uh, get readings and so forth. Um, they have decided to launch their own stable coin. Stable coins are like um, basically like a digital dollar, essentially. Um, and so this was really good news for the crypto sphere, but because people are still somewhat attached to this idea of, oh, we had really bad inflation and so it's probably not going to end well, so we're probably going to have a recession. You know, it didn't really buoy the markets as much as it might have if people weren't still attached to this idea that, yeah, we're, we're going to have a recession. You see what I'm saying? And so, you know, there typically markets are driven by two things, greed and fear, right? So when the markets are doing well, people are get greedy and they, I want some of that money and they they invest and then the, and things go up and, and then more people come and it, and it can turn into this bubble, right? The reverse is also true. When the market's going down, people flee the markets because, oh my God, I don't want to lose my money. And so they, and so the, these, these are very subjective emotions, right? They are, they're greed and fear they're not above they're below they're instinctive right like uh, you know get me some of the good stuff and and run away when the bad stuff's coming very really base emotions um and and this so with mercury mixing between the above and below we might need to use our rational faculties to say hey you know it's possible that this, all of this talk that we were bound to have a recession, maybe that was, maybe that's not true. Maybe we can go through this without having a recession. Now, I'm not telling you that that's a fact. I'm just telling you that we need to be aware of these base emotions and when and how they conflict with what 
our our objective mind is telling us or like um where for instance like just for instance you know gary like you know making profits in the whether it's the stock market or the crypto market or whatever is not you know the whole point of life like being a spiritual person is also really important and maybe you need to like get your head out of the markets for a little while and you know just talk to people about being spiritual both of those are both you see we could talk about either direction whether there's an imbalance on the material side or on the um, spiritual side or whether there's an imbalance on the instinctive side or the rational side but just being aware when life is showing you these imbalances gives you a an incredible opportunity to do the rebalancing to 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 refigure to to understand what's going on what's actually going on instead of being driven by these things that you th you know these versions of reality that may or may not be true you see <clears throat> so one of the other things that i like to talk about in terms of the elements is is these qualities um this is something that i go through you know in detail in my book hermetica triptica the mercury elemental year um this idea that earth element is dry and cold right and if you know anything about um this idea of um, temperaments in astrology, this dry and cold, dry means separate, separative, right? It um, separates things and cold is that it lowers the energy. And so um, earth is, no, is considered to be melancholic and the planet Saturn is also considered to be similar. It's dry and cold. It's about boundaries and limits and so forth. And so, um it's an interesting relationship between you know earth provides the boundaries for both sea and sky right and so and saturn is also a planet of boundaries so there's this sort of sober um understanding of limits of like okay you know this much is okay this much is this much is good this much is okay and this much is too much like really understanding you know, where the limits are and how far you can push something and when you need to pull back and, and so forth. Um, and, and parsing out that out is really important um, with an earth year. Um, dryness is about, you know, really pulling things apart and saying, okay, like, you know, just because everybody was saying there was going to be a recession for a while, does that necessarily make it true? Or, or were they just afraid, right? Fear drives the markets and people were very afraid. And so, but they, so now at some point that fear can make that thing, right? We literally had bank runs where people panicked and banks failed, you know? And so that, that fear can literally be a self-fulfilling prophecy where we create the very thing that we were afraid of, Um but at this moment, it seems like maybe that's not actually happening. So let's pull this apart. Like, does this necessarily add up to this? Just pulling things apart and looking at them. Um, coolness is about energy coming into form. So like, for instance, when water cools, water vapor cools, it becomes dew, right? So it condenses, it, it becomes more and so materialization right earth when lava cools it becomes rock right and so um so lowering your energy also means becoming somewhat dispassionate about things right fear when you're in a state of fear that means that you are uh you're upset and generally speaking when you're upset you you, you you're not thinking clearly because you're in an emotional state and so by lowering that energy and just saying okay take a breath calm down you know just look at this sort of um 
you know, what they say, calm, cool, and collected, right? So lowering energy could literally mean like, let's just chill out for a second and look at things from a sort of chilled point of view rather than from a, a worked up either greed, like excited, oh, I want to be part of this or fear, oh, I'm scared, I want to run from this. Like, what if we can just look at it like calmly and dispassionately? Um, that that's a that's a major um uh, strength of earth actually um so earth earth is one of the most stable elements provides boundaries to the sea and sky it's about money and resources um it's made of many diverse minerals this is something this diversity of the earth element is something that i think is often taken for granted you know um their earth people are often multi-talented people they're very quiet about it usually but they're good at many things um and because you know when you once you dig down you know the 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 symbol for earth is a triangle pointing downward right and so on the for surface earth looks kind of boring it's just brown dirt you know but once you once you look like um in a canyon for instance all the strata that happens in all the different colors of the rocks and the different minerals. There's a lot going on there that shows a lot of uh, diversity. And so, you know, the idea being like, hey, there's a lot of different tools I can use to address whatever situation is going on. I don't need to simply just run away or dive in like I could, you know, I could, um, you know do a test and try a little bit and see how that works and you know the the idea is that there's a lot of different approaches once you begin to chill out and under and and you can begin to um look at things from a diverse set of points of view and you'll have a lot better chance of um pulling things off Okay, so let's look at, at an example here so that uh, to bring all of this theory kind of down to earth. Um and come back to that. One of the one of my favorite articles that I've written, I, I wrote it for the um AA journal, the the Astrological Association of Great Britain. Um back when it was like the five hundred year anniversary of uh Luther's theses you know the protestant reformation and so i took a look at martin luther's chart and um and i took a look at it specifically through the lens of this idea of the mercury elemental year and in in case you're not familiar with it well, many people are that follow me but in case you're not familiar with it the idea is that these areas that Mercury um, goes over three times and spends a lot of time in, they are important to your chart, whether or not Mercury's actually in those zones in your chart at the time you were born. So that the retrograde before your birth and the retrograde after your birth show up in these areas are kind of highlighted um, regardless of whether you were born during the retrograde itself. That's the basic idea. They, these, these are kind of the bookends, the mercurial bookends for your birth that sort of frame and, and uh, give structure and boundaries to the, the event um, that is in the middle, which is your birth. And so Luther was born... Um, 10th of November, 1483, right? Um, with Leo rising. And he he literally has zero planets in Earth, which is very interesting because um, his Mercury is in Sagittarius conjunct the, uh, the alpha star of Hercules. And what, it's interesting because he was known as the German Hercules because he took on the most powerful man in the Pope man in the world and and kicked his butt 
um, which is yeah, can't can't be understated. But you know, Luther came from working class roots. His father was literally um, a smelter of ore, um, which is very earthy, right? Literally taking the rocks out of the mountain and smelting. You know, um, he was popular with the common people. He used earthy language. He had a propensity for vulgar in even obscene language i mean some of the way some of you know he accused the pope of being basically born out of the butt of a she devil <laughs> and had illustrations for it like this guy really used the power of the printing press to full effect um he was a priest but he was married he had kids he liked to drink you know um he he translated the Bible into vernacular, the common language of the people, and put it into the hands of the laity. So most people that would go to church, they would have the Bible read to them by the by the educated people, because it was in Latin, right? It was it's so no if you didn't know if you didn't know Latin, if you weren't educated, you had no hope of understanding the Bible for yourself. You had to get it secondhand. And Luther said, no, 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 no. We're going to put the Bible in the hands of the people. That's a very earthy thing to do. And he was tremendously hardworking. I mean, the guy wrote uh, an incredible number of um, books and and things. And he, and he was famously very stubborn. I mean, he would not back down, you know, messing with the pope would get you worse than killed it would get you tortured and like drawn and quartered back in the day and he just didn't he didn't care he would not back down so how is it possible that a person with all of these characteristics had zero earth in their chart well it's not actually because luther was born during a mercury elemental year of earth Luther was born in a year where Mercury was in the earth signs more than all of the other signs combined. So even though Luther wasn't born with Mercury in earth or anything in earth, while well, the midheaven was in earth, um, there's still this earthy quality that sort of surrounds the, the birth and sort of gives it this, this quality of um, containment. Right. The the retrograde before Luther's birth was in Virgo and the retrograde after his birth was in Capricorn houses two and six, which are also very earthy houses. They're about resources and about skills and so forth. Right. So I just thought that was a really, really interesting. Um, and if you look at, you know, what we were saying before, Earth is cool and dry. Right. Earth is dry, becoming cool. So dry is about separating, right? Luther Luther said, no, I'm not. His father sent him to school to be a lawyer because he needed, you know, to to someone to help him, uh, you know, get um, around the laws regarding the, the smelting of ore and stuff. And L Luther was like, no, I'm not going to be your, your, you know, lackey or whatever i'm going to do my own thing and and he ended up um being called to go into the ministry being called to be a, a priest and then he ended up separating from the church so there's this dryness the separate the separating um and and then uh, also it's about it's cool it's about going within you know luther separated from the family business because in, he felt an inner calling for something else, right? And then once he got into the church, he felt an inner calling to to deny the idea of of um, indulgences. He said, "You can't, you can't sell. You know, you can't sell people salvation. Salvation comes from faith alone. You know, it's from grace alone, the grace of God. You can't buy it." Once you start selling it, you've you basically just, you know, made the whole thing a joke. Um, and so he trusted his inner truth. You know, he read the Bible for himself and he said, you know, he said, this doesn't add up, you know. Um, 
He was wor- very hardworking. He questioned the selling of indulgences to pay for the new cathedral. He saw the church as overstepping its bounds. So that most importantly, he understood there's a boundary here. Like you've crossed the line. This is actually n- not just not right, but it's probably evil. It, it certainly could lead to evil, you know, and eventually he was very convinced that the Pope was evil. Um which, you know, I mean, really, God only knows, literally, but um, Luther uh, was also very, had a diversity of interests and was very practical. He he employed artists to make these woodcuts and use the power of images to convey his ideas. So he was very multi-talented, multimedia. In fact, this was the original multimedia dude. He used the power of the printing press and he literally, like I said, I mean, he literally had this one image of the Pope being shat out of, of this she devil, you know, it's like, Whoa, dude, like that's pretty graphic. Um, But it, it, it really, you know, kind of brings home the these images would really bring home the the intensity of the, his ideas that look this is not good this is not wholesome this is bad and uh we need to get away from it and um you know on a more on a more wholesome level the bible then as it, once it was printed in the german vernacular it became like Uh, something that people had in their home and so that children could learn to read from the bible it was like often the only book that people had right because people didn't have a lot of books back then and so it it became used as a primer and so here's this like multi-functional yes it's the word of god and we use it for worship but it's also like you can just learn to read with it you know and so there's there's a tremendous amount of earthiness in Luther's life, in his work, and in his contribution. And the only way you can explain it is that he was born in the Mercury elemental year of Earth. So I'm going to invite all of y'all to figure out. Um, so remember, Earth is cool and dry. So cool means about going within right so paying attention to your inner experience what emotions are running your life to some degree are you being motivated by greed or fear or 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 jealousy or any of these other emotions um uh you know what's going on in there right um what's going on in your inner world um and also about dryness right earth earth is cool but it's also dry like can you separate you know it, these emotions that seem to be boiling up inside are they really yours or are these just things that you were told that you should feel and you just felt them out of some duty like this is what we do as a family we we're you know we we do this and so you went along with it and like th- is that even really yours is that is that authentically yours so separating out like what emotions belong or is this like just a collective thing like right like right now everybody seems to think they can tell us how we feel they can tell us who we are i'm not such a fan of that like i don't think you really know me and i certainly don't know that you think that you know exactly how i feel not not unless i've you've actually listened to me um and so like separating out like where is this coming from you know where does it belong and so locating what's going on and then separating out where is it coming from where what does it belong do is it something that's helping me great then you know we can keep it if it's something that's not necessarily helpful how do we you know go about separating ourselves from it um where is the source where this emotion keeps getting re-energized right and disconnecting from that source see um 
And typically, this is going to show up in three houses of your chart, right? Because the earth signs, there are three of them. They're called the earthy triplicity because there's three of them. And the, these three charts fall into a series of what I call trigons so that they may be um, in a series of related houses, right? So I, I mentioned before that Taurus is my fourth house and I had this thing with my father during the last retrograde well houses four eight and twelve are all related um and and so um so now Virgo is my eighth house and so while I may not have to deal with the same you know situation it doesn't mean that it's entirely unrelated right so houses four eight and twelve Anyone with an air sign rising, whether it's Gemini, Libra, or Aquarius, you're going to experience those houses, 4, 8, and 12, being activated this year. And I call that the trigon of dynasty. It's about it's about family, but it's also about it's about where you come from, but it's also about what you leave behind. And it, you know, it's interesting because I'm trying to write a book. And meanwhile, you know, I'm having to deal with, you know get my father situated in a in a in a nursing home and so that literally the fourth house like where you come from and what in in like what i'm trying to leave behind like i want to publish a book that hopefully you know is is still here whenever i'm gone um so you can see these um kind of and of course anybody with earth signs rising these three retrogrades are going to be activating houses one, five, and nine, which I call the identity trigon. Um, for people with fire signs rising, they're going to be activating the houses two, six, and 10, which I call the trigon of mastery. It's about skill and career. Um, and then with people with water signs rising, Th houses three seven eleven are being activated this is about social aspects of your life so if we go back to that um you know these these four areas of life that the vedic astrologers call arta which is about uh resources so again if you if you are a um if you are a fire sign rising then the Arta houses, two, six, and 10 are being, so it's about resources. So what, how are you using your resources? What skills are you developing to, to um, exploit those resources? And how is this um, uh, contributing to you being known in your career, right? So that's Arta. And then um, Moksha, Moksha properly understood is about liberation. So, so it's really about kindness in in a spiritual sense, but in terms of um in terms of you know just more basic Western ideas, it would be about intimacy, right? So so in Maslow's hierarchy, we talk about your need for belonging with other people, your need for the having the esteem of other people, other people thinking that you're a good person you know, uh, and, and, and qualified to do what you do and maybe even excellent at what you do. These are all have to do with our intimacy needs. And so people with, um, water sign, uh, rising, um, are going to have houses, uh, three, seven and 11, uh, these moksha houses of of different kinds of relationships being activated, right? And then, um, whoops, going the wrong way there. Uh, kama, the they call the kama houses are about um, pleasure and beauty and also aspiration. Um, and then we have uh, dharma, which is about your purpose, your the, the your higher truth if you will. Um, and so the um, the earth signs rising really are going to be dealing with like your purpose, your higher truth. What identity 
are you living through? And is that really serving your dharma, your higher purpose? Right? Um, so we'll talk more about these individually here in just a second. Okay, so let's get back to the individual um, situations here. So, Okay, so as I said, anybody with an earth sign rising, so Taurus. Um, and this would also apply for those with um, sun sign earth or moon sign earth. So rising sun or moon sign could apply. Um, it was developed specifically to... Um, vis-a-vis -vis your rising sign so you if you know your the time you were born then then the 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 uh sign that was rising in the east at that particular hour that's literally what horoscope means horoscopos means hour marker so it means the sign that was marking the hour of that time um so for earth signs Houses one, five, and nine are being activated. So house one is literally our identity, but it can be, you know, I often refer to this idea of like, you know, the hats that you wear, right? So, you know, on any given day, you know, I was wearing the hat of like a neighbor earlier this morning when I took the trash out to the street, you know, and the, the neighbor was out there and we were talking for a minute. Um, you know, then I, I came back inside and wore the hat of a of a landowner for a while. I was taking care of my yard and and everything. And now I'm wearing the hat of a professional astrologer, podcaster, right? So this so the various hats that you wear and like whether or not you're happy with wearing them or whether or not they're you're actually getting anything out of wearing them, right? is going to come up whether or not you know you're a virgo rising or or you're a taurus rising or you're a capricorn rising this idea of identity is going to be baked in um especially for virgos though of course um and then the fifth house is like okay i've got this identity i put this hat on there are certain creative things that i can do like by putting this hat on like by being a podcaster you know, I can share various ideas with y'all. I can have guests on my show. I can do, and when I have guests on the show, for instance, they open up new ideas, ninth house, right? New territory that we can explore. Hey, let's have a guest on the show to talk about this topic that we don't usually talk about, right? Ninth house. So you see all three of these houses are related. And even though the retrograde might not be activating one of these houses, directly because of their natural relationship you might experience any the, the the effects of the retrograde in any one of these houses right so um so for virgo rising you know with your first house being activated there's an opportunity to develop and express a persona persona simply meaning you know a social role that was not previously available to you you know like for instance you know when i first started podcasting back in 2008 there was like five of us <laughs> i was literally one of the first people to do it and now all kinds of people have a podcast and uh, who knows maybe you too can join join the podcasting movement if you haven't done it before, that would be a, a, one way of developing a new persona, right? Um, for Taurus Rising, House 5 is asking you to look at your creative expressions and see, like, what does this creative activity, how does it open and expand your possibilities, even if it's just like it frees up your mind to um to be less um focused on like you know emotional activity or problems or worry or whatever maybe maybe it's just simply that maybe it opens up new ideas about the world and about life and about god or who knows what but but 
focusing on your creative aspects should lead to the ninth house opening up new possibilities. And for Capricorn, understanding the, the unique blend of cultural um, ideas and cultural um, input in your life, because we all have different cultural um, inputs in our life and understanding how um, those come together in, in a specific way to create you and understanding that, hey, if I, you know, mix it up a little bit and I add a little, you know, a little bit more of one of these, that's going to be a different me, isn't it? It's going to be kind of pretty much the same. But one of the flavors, if you think of it like a recipe, like you're adding more of one spice or more of one ingredient, you're 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 really showcasing that part of your identity. It's still the same mix, um, but it, it's it's um, it's sort of highlighting one part of it, right? And so that um, these these um, cultural, philosophic, or religious in inspirations that you have they can they help form your identity and and the way that those come together um if you play with it a little bit you might find that you have some new hats to wear or you might find that you feel a sense of freedom in who you are that you previously did not a sort of freshness or or what have you Okay, and for fire signs rising, of course, we talked about these are the Arta houses, the resources, second house, the, the skills that you have to, to deal with these resources, sixth house, and the career or the public reputation that comes as a result of the skills that you build, see? Um, so for Sag rising, Virgo is the um, 10th house. And so, um, so you might be focused on developing um, new professional roles. There might be some part of your career that you haven't got to wear that particular hat yet, and um, and you might and and by or you've been avoiding it. <laughs> right either one that you haven't been able to do or one that you've been like no no i don't want to do that one but either way by embracing it you might find that new resources come your way right because think about what we talked about the diversity of the earth element right these days it's all everybody's got a side hustle why because if you have multiple income streams then it's a built-in hedge against any one of those income streams being disrupted, you see? So that, you know, if you have, um, if you, so if you're able to take on the challenge of developing yourself professionally, it's gonna give you a, another possible income stream, which is going to increase the diversity of your, um, of your, you know, uh, ARTA, um streams and that's going to um you know give you more security right for leo rising um developing your resources or your or your talents remember resources aren't necessarily physical right if somebody is a con naturally confident person which leos definitely usually are that's a resource right confidence there are certain things that you cannot do without some amount of confidence. You know, like I remember when I was a door to door salesman, you know, you cannot go knock on a hundred doors a day without some amount of confidence. Like, you know, it just, you can't do it. And so understanding that confidence as a resource rather than just, Oh, it's a neat part of my identity. This is something that you can use that you can, um, and and develop as a as a skill right so my confidence can become a skill and once it becomes a skill that i develop then it can lead to you know 10th house career um type stuff right it 
Um, and, and for Aries, Virgo is the sixth house. So developing new skills or developing competency in new areas um, can can redefine your profession. You know, I've noticed on Twitter, there's a lot of people talking about offering classes and how to draw a chart by hand, which, you know, back when I was coming up, like there, you, there was no choice. You had to draw the chart by hand because there were no freaking computer programs yet, <laughs> you know, but now everybody's got the computers like, oh yeah, you can learn how to, and learning how to draw the chart by hand, even though you've got a computer to do it and it's not necessary, it can show you, you can learn so much about the art itself by doing that, that it's way more than worth it to learn that competency, even if it's not a competency that is strictly necessary at this moment in time, you see? But it's really rewarding to understand where all of that stuff comes from. It's like it's like continuing education, right? Um, and, and, and so, you know, continuing education is how we keep growing, how we keep developing. uh for the for the water signs again this is the relationship trigon houses three seven and eleven so seventh house is about one-on-one -on -one relationships whether it be you know romantic partners best friends enemies lawyers lawyer is your best friend in court for instance um seventh house relationships are relation business partners relationship between equals right eleventh house is your relationship to someone else who is the member who is a member of of a group right a lot of people seem to want or assume there's an 11th house relationship between two people who are astrologers on twitter and it's like that's not necessarily so right just because you're both astrologers doesn't mean you belong to the same group it means you you practice maybe the same profession but actually belonging to the same group is is a little bit different. It's about sharing um, goals, sharing ideas, right? Being more, it's more about being like minded, right? And it, you, that may or may not be true. Um, and so, but when it is true, then you belong to a group of people who share those ideas and goals in in, in your relationships with other people in that group vis-a-vis -vis those goals and ideas is is the 11th house and then when your group interacts with another group that's third house that's intergroup activity because what is the third house is like your local neighborhood but what's a neighborhood made up it's made up of various groups that all got to learn how to get along right so three seven and eleven are the relationship trigon um, for Pisces rising, of course, this is the seventh house. And so you might be developing, you know, reach out to somebody that is is like, for instance, you know how they say, oh, so-and-so is not my type. Great. Because you know what? If you're honest with yourself, following your type hasn't always worked out. <laughs> right? Am I right? You know, and so like, what about blowing up your type and just like relating to somebody just because they're interesting or just because or or because they're very much not your type and be like, hey, what's it like to relate to somebody that's not my type? And and, and it, it, it would be a good exercise, even if it's not necessarily going on a date, even if it's just relating to them as friends or as social acquaintances like blowing up this idea of your type because you know we tend to get stuck in these echo chambers of like you know this is who i am these are the kind of people i hang out with and you know mercury retrograde is here to some degree to blow that up and so if you blow it up willingly then it doesn't have to be done to you maybe it would actually be kind of fun instead of being a huge pain in the tuchus you see what i'm saying for Scorpio rising, Virgo is the 11th house. And so developing relationships within your groups in a way 
that it it challenges them to relate to other groups. So challenging the members of your group, hey, why do we have this antithetical relationship to this other group? What is it that we really disagree with them about? And um, and was that always so? And right, just really breaking it down, like what's going on with us and this other group? Um, um, that could be really productive, could be a, a way of refreshing your your group relationships by contrasting your group with another group. You can renew and um and uh revisit the the relationships within your group and keep them from getting stale. For cancer rising, Virgo is the third house, and so developing your relationships between groups, intergroup relationships, um, is a way that you could move into more direct one-on-one -on -one relationships. So, you know, friend of a friend, for instance, hanging out with a friend of a friend and actually um, getting to know them could result in, guess what, having a new friend. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, like taking a chance on on that kind of thing, which can be hard for cancer, right? They're very private. And so just the mere fact that somebody's a friend of a friend might not normally be enough for them. But in this case, it might be worth a shot because it might open doors that, um, and again, it might get the energy moving in a way where, you know, keeps the other less pleasant stuff from visiting your door just because you're exercising those muscles, you see? Um, and again, for the air signs rising, these this is houses four, eight, and 12, which I call the trigon of dynasty because the fourth house is not just, you know, what where we come from, but it's also what we leave behind, right? It's the, the end of the matter is what a lot of the old books talk about, right? The end of the matter is, what the hell, why was I here? Why am I here? You know, what is all, what's the purpose of all of this? This, this is the kind of questions that we're talking about with houses four, eight, and 12. Um, so for uh, Gemini rising, Virgo is the fourth house. So challenging the roles that you take on or took on, it could be the past within your family of origin will expand the way that you can relate to people in your marital or business relationships, right? Eighth house. Okay. So just, just blowing up like, well, this is who I was in my family. Well, okay, great. But does that mean that's all, uh, that I'm locked into that for all time? You know, um, what happens if you, you step outside of that, you know? Um, what happens if you maybe you've maybe you've rejected that for a really long time and what happens if you actually find a part of that that you can embrace you know oh there was like a kernel of healthy you know something there's not always and never don't really exist right there's nothing that is always unhealthy and there's something there's nothing that is never healthy there was a seed of healthiness in there or it wouldn't have existed right and so finding that so either way, um, again, for Aquarius rising, this is the eighth house. So challenging your marital or business partnerships in a way will expand your spiritual or culture of possibilities, right? Because the 12th house. So um, sort of, you know, you know, like for instance, this morning I took out the trash and, and what, like, that's my job. Like my wife and I, we tend to divide the, the, uh, labor and pretty traditional roles, even though we're not traditional otherwise really, but somehow we divide a lot of the labor up along traditional roles. Um, but you know, like what if I was to say, Hey, I could use your help with this, with this task, even though it's usually been, you know, my task, it's been my task forever. Um, what if I was to say, Hey, you know, um, I could use your help with this task, even though you know, it's always right. So challenging those roles, like breaking out of like, or like, 
you know, um, offering to help with the task that is uh, that has normally been, you know, her task, right? Same thing with business roles. Like, yeah, I know usually you, you know, this is your area and this is my area, but like, you know, mixing things up a little bit and in, in, in blowing those roles up a little bit could lead to new possibilities. Um, it could lead to like, uh, understanding like wow you know there was a lot i was making a lot of assumptions about like what like you know generally speaking if we d aren't doing something and someone else is doing it we have ideas about what they're doing and why they're doing it but we don't really know but when we're actually doing it with them it's like oh that's why you do it that way i didn't realize but i always thought you did it that way because of blank but you you're actually doing it because of this other thing and once you realize that, you know, then it might open up discussion for, you know, um, deeper things so like the 12th house, like, you know, spiritual, deeper spiritual connections can come from that because you're seeing this person, you're understanding them, right? You're not just, uh, you know, you do this, I'll do that. And, you know, you're in your separate roles, you see? Um, and then for Libra rising, the 12th house is virgo is the 12th house 12th houses can be really tough um one of the ways that i think like to think of the 12th house in a positive sense is that it is your relationship with the archetypes and so what archetypes am i embodying you know what archetypes am i being a conduit for and how can i is, is there a different archetype that maybe I want to, you know, like, for instance, you know, I tend to be the Mercury guy. I tend to do a lot of work with Venus and stuff. You know, what if I mixed things up and, you know, um, started, you know, really talking about Jupiter or so, some other thing that I don't normally talk about, right? That would be a way of mixing up the archetypes and like, now you know ideally you would res that would be in response to some kind of call that you would you know some whether it was a synchronicity or a dream or something like that where it's like oh there's this archetype that i don't usually work with showing up well if that's the case you really want to try to respond to that and welcome it because this is a chance to, to for the for the this mixing of opposites to occur in the 12th house right and that can bring really fundamental change because you know the next retrograde of course is going to be happening in the fourth house right and and so it can really bring it can um really um renew things in a really fundamental way so i think that's it i think we went through all the signs there um yeah, I'm going to plug my book before we're done. Don't forget um, Hermetica, Triptycho, the Mercury Elemental Year is available through Rubido Press. There's a link on my website on the book page, and it's also available on Amazon. If you don't have it yet, it's a really practical guide to using these. And the, the final chapter is really one of my favorites where these, these elemental years repeat predictably every six to seven years we have a mercury elemental year in earth or whichever element you were born in it will repeat every six to seven years so that you get these ages where basically you have a mercury return at the same time as your solar return every six to seven years and and there's 12 of these over the course of 79 years and i developed this uh, I developed it as a developmental model. I, I looked at this as a as a development of the personality, development of the of the soul, in sort of alchemically, like becoming more and more authentic to what this this lesson that this element that you're here for. So Luther, for instance, you know, becoming more and more earthy over each of these returns. Um, that's I'm probably that's the part of the book that I'm most proud of because it, re, it seems like that's the part that really hit people um, really in a way where, you know, 
it, it's easy to look at your chart, right? And say, okay, this is me. Here's the transits. This is the part that's getting activated. These are the issues of the moment or whatever. But we don't often get this developmental framework of like, okay, this is me, but where am I on this arc of development in, in this, this me that the birth chart represents in like my full expression of that, where am I in this arc of development? And, um, and so that's, I was really happy that I, I, I really wanted to do that. And I had an idea and it, and, and, uh, and it came, it just came through so beautifully. That was when I knew yeah, you know what, dude, you probably are channeling something here because that chapter literally just flew out of me. Um, and so if you understand, like, it, for instance, if you were born in the Mercury elemental year of Earth and you understand, like, where you are in this lifelong process of these Mercury elemental years of Earth returning and this returning to you, this returning to what Earth is here to teach you and what you're here to teach others about earth understanding where you are in that arc of development there's such a rich it's like it's sort of like it, it i think it fills the need of like an initiation or a rite of passage which we have so few of you know um yeah you know when you graduate high school maybe when you get your diploma when you get a new job or something like that, but we don't really have um, a lot of opportunities for those. And I feel like the reason why it hits people so hard is it gives them a sense of that, um, that thing that's kind of missing in our society of these, in, in, these, these blah, initiations and rites of passage. Um and it can also give you an idea of where you're needing one if if it's if if it's not going on how can i jump start this how can i take this to the next level you know there's exercises in the book also um to do that um before we go there's one other thing i wanted to share which i think is really interesting um this oh let's see that's let me get back out of that. The image of Mercury's um, movement through the heavens, it's not this simplistic back and forth. Mercury in this particular loop much like Venus actually goes by the star Regulus and then dives down under the ecliptic and then rises back up across the ecliptic around retrograde motion. So if we just look at this loop, there's like this long, slow descent. And then during the retrograde, Mercury's actually moving upward. And then towards the station direct, it goes whoosh, and it goes up and out really fast so the most volatile part of this is de most de definitely around the direct station and so even though we're in the so-called shadow of which you know again what part of the shadow we can talk about like the alchemy part like there's negretto there's a black shadow which is about something falling apart if something's falling apart in your life there's a reason why and you, that's what, you know, once you get the reason why, albedo, eureka, I get it, I understand why this is happening, then you can move towards um, rebuilding your life, rubido, the reddening, you see? And so you break apart, put back together, alchemy, right? Something is breaking apart because that's, A, that's what things do. B, that's how life work, happens, like right? Like, you know, when I take the... The stuff out of my garden and i put it in the compost pile i sprinkle a little bit of the the, the previous compost on there to kind of get it started to break it down makes it this the 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 process faster right so if you understand oh something in my life is breaking apart oh let me throw some compost on there and just get it going rather than fighting it actually working with it you know um 
So, and then that leads to a breakthrough, which leads to a new you. That's there's, so there's really three kinds of shadow, but with in this particular case, because there's this long, slow descent, and then Mercury gradually moves up, and then all of a sudden he just pops up over the and this this um around the the 20th of September, Mercury crosses the the ecliptic it, right after turning direct, crosses the ecliptic. This is a very powerful thing called uh Jauzahir or Guzahar uh, is the Latinized version. It's a North Node passage. I have seen these be very powerful for the markets. And so with Mercury in its own sign of Virgo, having just stationed, which means it's now being reborn as the morning star. So A, it's there's a new synodic cycle of Mercury happening there's there's a resumption of direct motion it's in its own sign of domicile and exaltation it's crossing the north node it's crossing the ecliptic moving up upward it's crossing its own north node this is really powerful so there's a chance that if you do the work of breaking down the negretto um understanding why this th th thing in your life is in need of breaking down then the rebuilding phase could be really powerful after the direct station. There is a tremendous opportunity, it looks like there to me, to um, have some really positive, powerful forward momentum coming out of this. So imagine yourself like a spring getting compressed. And it's like, okay, okay, okay. And sooner or later, when that when it's time, that all that energy that's been compressed, ping, it's going to get released. And there, there could be, you might be really happy that you went through what you went had to go through because in the end, it got you moving again. It got you into a really cool place, you see? Um, so that's one other thing that I just wanted to share. Like literally nobody else talks about this, even though this is literally the actual movement of Mercury. It's not this made up shadow thing that doesn't actually exist. It's like the literal movement of Mercury. Still, somehow, I'm like literally the only person that ever talks about it, <laughs> which I find like really <laughs> kind of crazy. But because I'm the only person that talks about it, by God, I'm going to freaking talk about it because, damn it, it needs to be talked about. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um yeah that at the period after direct station looks like a really powerful opportunity for rebuilding renewing revivifying your life and so try to remember to trust the process um and and look for the meaning and the purpose in the process and i think if you can do that there's a really powerful opportunity for revivification here um later on in September. Okay, so don't forget to stop by dreamastrologer.com, sign up for my newsletter, visit me on the social media, like, share, and all that good stuff. And um, I look forward to seeing y'all again soon. I'll probably be revisiting um, when Venus you know, rises from the underworld, I'll probably do a podcast on the new Leo cycle at that point in time. So eh, I'll see y'all in, you know, definitely in uh, September at the latest. Okay, bye for now.